what happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project. We are now a good portion of the way into 1981 here. That's right, it's starting to feel a little bit more like the decade as we know about. And the number of movies that I know and have seen going into each block is increasing with each one. We're starting to get some more slashers. We're starting to get more of the faces that we're familiar with from 80s movies. And yeah, this block is chock full of those. We're going to kick this one off on August 28th with Hell Night although it did have some limited showings on the 7th, but went wider on the 28th. It starts with a big costume party that little Reagan is attending, not, not so little anymore, and as part of a pledge initiation, a group of the students have to go and spend one night in Garth Manor, where a man killed his family and then committed suicide. The children were deformed, and the mansion was completely isolated, and the murders were 12 years ago and they're all locked in. One of the other pledges is Matthew Starr, who we'll see get his head smushed in the shower in a few years, and they all pair off while the frat plans to scare them with screams and moans in the hallway. But it turns out that there's real dangers on the premises, chopping off heads and breaking necks, and the score is so Manfredini-like that I had to go look to see if it was him. But it turns out that it was not. And this one was brought to us by Tom D. Simone, who worked through most of the 70s in gay porn, but also did the silly talking vagina movie, Chatterbox. This was his first horror work, although he'd later go on to have a pretty full career and did the hilarious parody, Reform School Girls, and then a run of TV shows. It also had some heavy hitters working behind the scenes. Chuck Russell served as one of the executive producers, and he managed to get one of his longtime friends on the film as a production assistant, which, if you don't know, is basically a gopher on a film set. That friend was Frank Darabont, and it was his first credit in the industry before going on to direct massive hits like The Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile. Besides that, according to Vincent Van Patten, who plays Seth in the film, one of the grips was a young Kevin Costner. For, for those that don't know, a grip is a guy who sets up the lighting equipment and camera stuff on a shoe. Uh, it's kind of wild that the people doing what was essentially grunt work on this one ended up being far more famous than anyone involved with it. When it got released, it got some rough reviews since most of the slashers released at this time were held to a pretty harsh scrutiny. Roger Ebert, notoriously a horror hater, was pretty unkind to it, but there were several views that praised the class warfare subtext within the film, as Blair's Marty character is from a lower class background to contrast against Barton's Jeff, brought up in a wealthy family. Blair's performance was maligned as well, earning her a Razzie nomination, although she'd lose out to a tie between Bo Derek and Faye Dunaway. Even with all that criticism, it still managed to be fairly profitable, earning $2.3 million, which isn't a big haul, but it only cost $1.4 but that wasn't enough to really sow the seeds of a sequel. My rating on it is a three. I, I think it's fun. It, it's a fairly standard thing, like, like you know what you're gonna get, but it gives it to you in an entertaining enough way. Its horror cultural significance is a three since it did get some notoriety and became more well known, had some heavy hitters behind the scenes and some horror notables in the cast, but never really reached that mainstream level. Should you watch it? Definitely. Make tonight a hell night. We should have left her behind. Why? Her behind is the best part. We should have kept her behind and left the rest of her. Next up, on September 10th, over in Australia, we had an entry with an interesting title in Lady Stay Dead. It starts with a guy in some tiny panties. Like, I hope these are comfortable. And he's obsessed with a pop star named Marie, to the point that he sleeps with a mannequin dressed like her. She's currently shooting a film version of Sheena, I suppose not the actual one that would come out in 1984, 
and he works as a handyman at the villa that she's living. He spies on her and she just sort of shouts at him. And, and one day he corners her in her room and rapes her and then drowns her in a fish tank. When trying to stash her body, he's found out by a neighbor who he also kills. But then Marie's sister comes to visit, who, who finds it confusing that no one's around. And this is a fully Australian production, part of the whole Ozploitation thing that was going on at the time, and cost around half a million dollars to make, so a fairly low budget, but not too low. The director was a guy named Terry Burke, who made a small number of films, and one of them was a horror flick from 1975 called In of the Dam. But this was his final horror work. He stopped working in the industry in the late 1980s, and after a bit of a slow start, things get pretty wild around the halfway point as Gordon's indiscretions are discovered and Jenny is left to face off against him in a battle of wits. It then becomes a sort of home alone or your next kind of thing as he tries to get in at her and she has to defend herself. If you're a Mad Max fan, there's a small role in here for Roger Ward, who played Fifi in that one, and here he's a cop that shows up to try to help. And the interesting bit is that outside of a couple of sort of premiere screenings, it was unable to get any sort of release. I guess the content of the film was a little too sleazy for most of the local companies to distribute. So they passed on it, and it took a little while for it to get a home release. And my rating on it is a two and a half. It's fine enough, it's fairly simplistic, uh, but works well enough. Uh, chances are you'll forget it shortly after you watch it though. Its significance is a one though, since it is not remembered at all, has no horror stars to note, and didn't launch any careers. Should you watch it? Maybe? It's not a bad watch, but it's not really worth going out of your way for. Bastards, dastard, and petrol! One day later, back in the US, September 11th gave us Night School, not to be confused with the Kevin Hart movie, which is in no way a remake of this one, although to be honest, a slasher would have improved that one. And yeah, I'm acting like I saw that or something. It begins at a daycare with Miss Baron here staying late and a mysterious person in a motorcycle helmet shows up and kills her. Judd here is the officer assigned to the case and they find that she's been decapitated and it's the second case with the same MO in the area. He goes to talk to the victim's night school teacher and a classmate tells him that she had a secret boyfriend and also meets an exchange student named Eleanor, played by Rachel Ward in her first film role. She's banging the professor, and when I say banging, I mean they're smearing red paint on each other in the shower like everyone does, am I right? Meanwhile, the killer continues to strike students of the night school, dumping heads in fish tanks, making for a really confused turtle right here. Um, it, it's then a standard slasher flick with a fair share of red herrings and victims, and has one of my favorite sequences of all time. See. The killer beheads his victims and stashes the heads in unusual places. And we know that he's killed again. And we know this guy is going to discover it. But the camera gives us a whole series of fake outs in places that it could possibly be before the reveal. It, it's awesome. And the director was Ken Hughes, although it was originally going to be directed by Alfred Soule, who had done Alice Sweet Alice and would shortly do the fun horror parody Pandemonium. He had just done a film called Tanya's Island with a young vanity, and she was also slated to appear here, most likely in the Eleanor role, but they both dropped out and Hughes was brought on board. He was a bit of an odd pick since he didn't have much horror in his filmography, although he had a few sci-fi flicks, but most of his recognition came from being the director of the Disney classic Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. This would ultimately end up being the last thing that he would work on, apparently retiring from the industry. Like, like a number of slasher flicks from the era, it was panned by the critics who just wrote it off as another of those, although it did get some regard. And in retrospective, it's been viewed more favorably by those who see it as having more in common with the Italian Gialli than the standard masked killer films of the age. One tiny note is that it was released in Spain as Psycho 2, although there's very little in here to justify that, and it was just an attempt to mislead the audience in watching it. It didn't perform all that well, only making around 1.6 million, but since it only cost 1.2, it wasn't really considered a bomb, 
but just didn't leave a mark on an oversaturated market. Oh, and also it did land on the UK nasty list, but wasn't prosecuted. And my rating on it is a 3.5. I think it's kind of a standard slasher at heart, but it has a few extra tricks up its sleeve to make it stand out a bit more to me, and I like it more than a couple of its competitors. Its significance is just a 2.5 though, since it didn't really do much new, and didn't have a roster of stars, and never really became all that known, but it made the nasty list, launched Ward into the industry, and did get some success. Should you watch it? Yes indeed, check it out. How do you want your eggs? Cooked. We're about to take a dip into the really obscure here because on September 5th in Portugal, the territory was discovered. It first screened at film festivals there and wasn't released in the US until 1990. It has a family on a vacation up in the woods, although there's been some tension amongst the members recently, and they're all planning on going on a hike together. It's little Annie's birthday, so she gets what every kid wants, a cooked whole pig. Yeah, I remember when my mom brought out the, the birthday pig. We, we all blew out the candles. The next day, they all head out on the trails and things get heated pretty early on. And, and there's tension about their guide possibly leading them in circles. And then it unexpectedly snows and the guide ditches them. So they're in the middle of nowhere and lost. And before you can say Blair Witch, it appears as if they're going in circles, passing the same tree over and over. And things start to get surreal when they find a bridge with a pair of French-speaking men with a ton of food, but they can't communicate, so they have to move on. Pretty soon, their hunger starts to take over and they realize there's only one available food source, each other. And, and this one is from Raul Ruiz from Chile, who never really got a ton of attention in the States, but is renowned as being one of the more inventive and unique filmmakers of the era. He won dozens of awards worldwide and was considered one of the most prolific and yet least known auteurs. He did work on some more mainstream projects with American stars like Klimt with John Malkovich, but the majority of his work was in his native Spanish language. This film was one of his earlier entries to be in English, even though it was intended for the Portuguese market. And interestingly, it was produced by Roger Corman, but it's unknown exactly how much of a part that he took in the process. It's reported that he was simply the financier and that his only direct contribution to the overall film was a single telegram that said, this movie must be very, very disgusting. Filming was difficult though, since they started running out of money halfway through and had to push it in order to get the funds to complete it. And meanwhile, other legendary filmmaker Vim Vendors visited the set and loved what he saw and started filming his own movie right there on the spot using Ruiz's cast and crew and made the film The State of Things. And I give this one a 3.5. It's a pretty interesting one to watch and there's some interesting subtext going on here that I'm sure I'll think about a bit more and appreciate it on a rewatch, but I feel like it's maybe drawn out a bit too long its significance is just a 1.5 though, since this is pretty lost in the film world. Sadly, Ruiz is unsung, but it earns a touch of relevance for just being part of his filmography. Should you watch it? Yeah, although it's pretty damn hard to track down in a nice quality. Like it's, it's on YouTube, but in a low grade form. On n'a pas mangé depuis longtemps. Ah non, alors ça, c'est mieux, ça mieux. Chiesa. Ça, ça, ça pourrait ça faire du oui. mal, lui. Chiesa. Du mal, estomac, du mal, lui. Vous pouvez regarder. We're wasting our time. Oh. This next one has an unusual reputation, and it came out on September 25th, and it has a cool name with The Boogins. It starts off with newspapers talking about a series of attacks in a small mining community that shut the mines down and caused the whole town to shut down. Much, much later, four men are headed down into it to try to reopen it, including Roger and Mark. Perfect breast. I'm telling you, I saw them. You saw them, both of them? Yes. Meanwhile, this creepy old man is peeping in on them and also a local woman who is dragged off by something unseen. The two ladies that Mark and Roger were discussing come into town and they all settle in for a while, but there's something lurking in the basement and whatever it is, it's got tentacles that whip out and grab you. So this one was brought to you by James L. Conway, who I've previously talked about on the sci-fi episodes of the project. 
He did the pretty entertaining Hangar 18 and the dreadfully dull Earthbound, and he only made a few features after this before becoming strictly a TV show director. This is one of the only horror entries on his filmography, but he did a couple of horror-themed episodes of some shows, but this is a bit of an anomaly for him. And here's what's weird on this one. So it came out in 1981 and played in theaters, but didn't do well in the reviews. Most critics called it incoherent and dull, although it got some praise with Stephen King giving it a good notice in Twilight Zone magazine. It didn't really do a lot of business though, although there's no box office numbers anywhere, but here's where it got interesting. For some reason that doesn't seem to be reported on anywhere, it wasn't released on VHS afterwards. It was just sort of forgotten, although fans of the film used to wonder where they could get their hands on it. There were blurbs in Fangoria magazine about the film's unavailability on the home market, and there was just nowhere to see it. Finally, in the mid-90s, over a decade later, it got a VHS release and was finally able to be viewed. Now, of course, it can be seen on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, The Works, and it has the fluffiest dog in film, Tiger. Reportedly, the film was originally meant to be pretty mild, but the studio then wanted to up the level of nudity and violence and was meant to show off more skin. However, halfway through filming, the actors backed out and said that they wouldn't do the nude scenes. But since they already had a good deal of footage, they couldn't recast them. So they ended up shooting around the nude scenes. And then there's the Boogans themselves. They're kept off screen for the majority of the movie and are only revealed in the last couple of minutes. But they're sort of weirdly adorable turtle monsters. And I, I keep saying that they because there's supposed to be more than one of them. But the budget was pretty low, so there was only one creature made. And my rating on this is a three. It, it's pretty close to a 3.5, but, but not quite. It's like three and a quarter, because it's decent and it has some fun stuff going on and a nice atmosphere, but just seems to stall a little too much for the middle portion of the film. Its significance is a two, since it was pretty forgotten and lost for a while and is still just sort of a hidden cult monster movie. Should you watch it? I think so. I mean, it's a, it's a decent monster romp. Oh, Next up is a movie I'm excited about, and it looks like it has an unconfirmed release date of sometime in September. Although Wikipedia says it was released in Arizona in June and Los Angeles on October 23rd, so it appears as if the actual release is questionable, and it's the unseen. It's set in Solvang, which is this really cute town a couple of hours outside of Los Angeles. And it's this little Danish town with windmills and stuff. It's, it's pretty great. And, and three friends are on a trip there after one left her boyfriend because she's a spy who didn't love him. Um, but there's a mix up with the hotel and they have to find someplace else to stay. And they find a spot with McMurphy's fellow mental patient. He lets them stay at the old farmhouse where his wife is, but it seems like they're also hiding something in the basement that attacks and kills Karen. So, young people on a vacation, countryside farmhouse, creepy family with a mysterious member. If that sounds familiar, it's because one of the writers on the film was Kim Henkel, who co-wrote the original Texas Chainsaw. And it's pretty clear that he's doing something similar here, except instead of the Deep South, he's going Deep Dutch. But the final product doesn't resemble his script at all, as it was altered before filming, to the point that he's no longer credited as a writer. But he published his version as a book entitled Deadly Encounter. And here's why I said I was excited about this one. I saw this ages and ages ago, apparently, and I guess sort of forgot about it. And as soon as I started watching it, and I saw the girl get dragged down to the vent, I said, oh yeah, I know this. Completely just jarred my memory. It was directed by Danny Steinman, who has a bit of a rough reputation in horror. He only did four films, an X-rated feature in 73, and then this one, and afterwards did Savage Streets with Linda Blair, and then his most noted film, Friday the 13th Part 5, where he was tagged as being a little overly sleazy and was accused of wanting to make a softcore sex film instead of a horror flick. He had a hard time getting a picture launched after that one and then was in a biking accident that prevented him from working and he left the industry. 
passed away in 2012. But, but hey, you may say, I looked at the opening credits and it doesn't say Steinman. The director is listed as Peter Folag, and that's a pseudonym since he had his name removed from the film as he was upset with the final cut of it, claiming that the cut butchered his work and ruined the scares. The cast and crew reportedly also had a really tough time with him as he was difficult to work with. Flounder makes a late in the game appearance as well as Leather, uh, I mean, Junior. Um, it, it didn't get much attention at the time, although the reviews weren't terrible, but it soon slipped into relative obscurity. And my rating for it is a 3.5. I like this one. It, it's dirty and creepy and weird, but it does kind of go into nothing new territory. Its significance is only a 2.5, though, since it is fairly unknown. But I can't give it too low since it's got Steinman involved, a script from Henkel, and has some recognizable faces. Should you watch it? Yes, don't leave this one, and I'm sorry, um, unseen. <laughs> This next one did have some screenings in May, but it went wide on October 9th, and it's dead and buried. And this is a low-key horror classic, and starts with a guy who might want to fight a killer snowman, and Lisa Blunt. And, and I think that horror fans are familiar with her from Prince of Darkness, but she got an Oscar from producing a short film called The Accountant that won in 2002. But this is sad. I was not aware that she passed away back in 2010. The photographer is beaten and then set on fire, so Sheriff Gillis, played by James Ferentino, comes in to investigate. And the coroner is Grandpa Joe, so thankfully he got out of bed to, to come and help out. And this was actually his final film as he died shortly afterwards. Turns out that the photographer's not dead, but hey, Freddy's on hand here helping out. And Harv is here too. And holy crap! So is this guy, and his name is Glenn Morshower, who's one of those oh yeah, that guy actors. Meanwhile, Dan's wife is Dale Arden, and they killed George in the hospital. But wait a minute, he's back? The mystery deepens and the killings continue, featuring some pretty wild and gruesome effects, which were done by none other than Stan Winston. He was an up-and-coming effects artist at the time, and this would be in the same year that he'd earned an Oscar nomination for the family-friendly Heartbeats. It was directed by Gary Sherman, and it was one of his earliest works, and his filmography is pretty diverse, with action and drama in there, but he returned to horror for the much-maligned Poltergeist 3. But the promotional material was very quick to state that it was from the creators of Alien. And that's because the script was by Dan O'Bannon and Russ Schusset, the writers of that classic. But there was some friction there. O'Bannon said after the fact that he had nothing to do with it. And Schusset wrote it himself, but needed his name in order to sell it. He agreed to do so as long as he could make suggestions and change the script that Schusset wrote. But unfortunately, none of those changes were actually made although O'Bannon didn't find that out until the film was released, and it was too late to get his name out of the credits. Even though it got some good reviews, it ended up being a bit of a dud in theaters, only pulling in around $200,000, where it cost $3 million, and its woes were compounded when it landed on the UK nasty list, but was not prosecuted. Later, though, it was acquitted of the charges and removed from the list. And I'm giving this one a 3.5. And, and yeah, this is another one that I would give a 3.75 if I had that rating. But it's, it's pretty great. The problem is that it takes a little too long to get to where it wants to be. Its significance is a 3 since it does feature some great horror talent with O'Bannon in there, Winston showing his stuff, and even England in attendance. But it's just so much on the fringe. It just never even hit that bigger cult status that you think that it should. Should you watch it? Definitely. Should I make the same pun? Uh, don't leave this one dead and buried. Same pun, everybody. You will try to kill me, Dan. But you can't. You can only make me dead. On that same day, October 9th, another film was released, although a touch sillier one, with Full Moon High. We've got a high school football team that go to the school of the title, including a Michael Myers victim and Coach Lubbock. 
And this might be one of uh, America's funniest home videos, I guess. And someone might be getting a giant check from Publishers Clearinghouse. And he needs to deliver some microfilm to Romania. And he takes Tony with him. And it's a comedy, so, that, so there's some jokes here and there. You'll enjoy it. And Tony has a palm reader tell him that he's cursed. And that night encounters a werewolf that he seems to think is a dog. He gets bitten and things get crazy on the plane back home when it's hijacked, but Tony changes and woofs out to attack them. Shortly after, he gets back home and his changes continue, but I guess he doesn't do anything but bother everyone, really, as it's said that all he does is bite women on the butt, which, you know, I've seen people post as a requirement on Tinder profiles, so not, not a big deal. But when his dad accidentally shoots himself, he leaves school to go find himself for several decades, staying the same age. So he returns to his own school and poses as his own son. He encounters all of his old classmates who have grown up and drastically changed. And I, I kind of can't believe that this one is from the horror legend Larry Cohen. He was one of the more underrated of the filmmakers of the era, but the guy did the It's Alive series. God told me to. Cue the winged serpent, the freaking stuff. This guy had some great stuff out there. And I have to say, I'm not sure that a straight comedy was really in his wheelhouse. And it's wild that this came out like, like a month or two after Student Bodies. Since they serve as similar kind of horror parodies, but whereas Bodies seemed interested on focusing on making fun of slasher flicks, this harkens back to classic horror a bit, but also brings in a touch of social commentary on the shift in American ideals between the 60s and 80s. But the accidental commentary that it makes is the difference in how werewolves are portrayed, because not only is this coming out after student bodies, but it's arriving shortly after The Howling, an American werewolf in London, which both changed the game in terms of lycanthropes on film. And yeah, this one seems perhaps a bit too old-fashioned. It's got bits with Laureen Landon, Mr. Miyagi, and even Monroe. But then Adam Arkin's dad, Captain Invincible, shows up, and it was the first time the pair had been in a big film together. And, and I'm sad to say, but my rating on this one is a 2.5. I love Larry Cohen, but this one just does not work. A lot of the humor falls flat, and it takes a third of the movie just to set up its premise. I want to like this much more, but I just don't. Its HCS is the same since it's a Cohen film, an early horror comedy spoof, and features a bunch of familiar faces. Should you watch it? I mean, I, I'd say yes. If you have a particular sense of humor, you, you may like it more than me. Come back, you premature ejaculator! October 9th was really busy since our final film of this block came out on that day as well, and it's another slasher, The Prowler. It starts after the ending of World War II with the soldiers coming home, and a woman named Rosemary who left her boyfriend during the war. In 1945, she has a new boyfriend, and they're killed by an unseen man with a pitchfork. It then jumps ahead to 1980 with Deputy Mark here, and this guy is Christopher Goutman who was only in a few things, but then went on to become a director and really involved in the soap opera world. He did like 70 episodes of one, but then went into producing and produced As the World Turns for over a decade. It's right before the big school graduation dance, but there's a killer on the prowl. Because he's the prowler. He kind of has to. You can't really skulk if you're the prowler. The dance has a rock band, and I'm curious, did anyone ever have a school dance with a cool band? In movies, there's always pretty decent rock bands playing, and in real life, I've only ever seen, like, like crappy bar bands covering oldies or something. Pam's neighbor is some kind of reservoir dog, and the bodies start to pile up while the mystery of the killer's identity deepens. So, the interesting thing about this block of films is that we have one that's by the future director of Friday 13 Part 5, and this one is from the future director of Part 4. Yep, in, in about two years' time, the final chapter will be led up by this film's Joe Zito. He had previously done a couple of flicks, including Blood Rage, that probably should have gone into the 1980s version of the project, and it was because of this film that he got the gig to kill off Jason. And hey, speaking of the final chapter, 
That reunited Zito with the special effects artist of this film, Tom Savini. Yes, the murders were all created by Savini here, and they are wildly over the top and pretty gruesome. So much so that it had to be dramatically edited in order to get an R rating, chopping out a big helping of the gore. And the cuts went even further in the UK, where it was released as Rosemary's Killer. Of course, the reviews weren't that favorable, but they actually weren't overly negative. It got far less scorn than some of the other by the number slasher flicks from the era, and some seemed to pick up on the subtext about the treatment of veterans in a post-war period. One person who truly appreciated it, though, was Tom Savini, who felt like it showcased his stuff in a proper way, and he calls it some of his best work. Audiences didn't embrace it as strongly, though, since it only did around a million dollars in ticket sales, around the same amount that it cost to make. Thankfully, it grew in cult status and earned a bigger audience on the home market, cable runs, and has since been called one of the greatest slashers of the era. And my rating on it is a 3.5. It's a good time and a solid slasher flick, even if it feels a bit like you've seen it all before. The mystery is also a little easy to figure out, considering the film doesn't really give you that many suspects to work with. And its cultural significance is a 3.5, since yes, it's a well-known slasher, and Zito and Savini are involved, but it never really earned that spot in the cultural eye that it would need, and it's still hovering around a sort of cult status. Should you watch it? Without a doubt, soak in those Savini spectacles. <laughs> So there you have it. There's a bunch of movies from the fall era of 1981, get, getting close to that Halloween time. And uh, yeah, there's a bunch of movies in this block that were, that were pretty damn good, but none that really stood out as being fantastic. There's no clear winner in this block. And I have to say my favorite of the bunch is probably, probably Dead and Buried. I think it, it's the one that has the most atmosphere and does the most unique things had the most kind of like interesting things that I hadn't quite seen before. It was a different take on zombies and that kind of like that, that weird um, like coastal town vibe. I, I like that one quite a bit. Let me know your favorite down below in the comments. Which one did you like the best out of this block? And if you liked the video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel to keep getting notified when more 80s project videos are coming out. Hit that little bell. If you think about it, go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines and help support this channel. Meantime, I'll see you very shortly as we continue on with the 80s project.